Today I want to talk to you about freedom from oppression. What do we mean by oppression? Oppression is imposed domination of another person or a group of people in order to control them mentally, physically, emotionally, and the worst of all, spiritually, in order to stifle their aspirations and limit their potential. To be oppressed is to be dominated or held down or suppressed in such a way as to cancel or control or to limit your divinely ordained potential. Everyone here who has been created by God, which is everyone here, was created with potential. Things that God has endowed you with in order to realize your maximum abilities to be used under God, your potential. A baby is a potential adult. It has to get there, but the potential for adulthood is resonant in the baby. That's where they're going. Oppression seeks to hold that down, to limit you, to stifle you, to control you so you don't reach your potential. So that you're stopped from maximizing your divinely ordained reason for even being here. It involves restricting your God-given human potential so that it can stop God's plan for your life. It's called oppression. Now, oppression can take many forms on many levels. There is political oppression. You find this in dictatorships or military governance uh, where a particular dictator in order to limit the power of others in the name of a political order. It's, it's Russian communism under Lenin and that Marxist way of life where walls are built to hold people in and to stop them from being able to move from one place or another place. It is to hold them or contain them to limit them. There is economic oppression. This is where the rich hold the poor down, keep them in classes so that they're not able to express themselves, get free to develop their own entrepreneurial spirit. It's where they are limited and they're stuck in ghettos, not because that's where they want to be, but that's where the system has forced them to stay. Economic oppression. We're all familiar in the United States of America with racial oppression where people are held down because of the color of their skin and the color of their skin prohibits them access to, to that which the rest of the society has free access to simply because how they look. There is domestic oppression. You often see this when a wife or a woman is so controlled by a man because of the threats of violence, I was sitting in my office one day and a husband and wife came in for counseling and it became clear what the problem was, which had not yet been verbalized because when the husband raised his hand to scratch his neck, she jumped. So it became very clear very quickly that this woman was living in fear. She was under the thumb of a dictator who using, falsely using the biblical word submit was actually using God's way to oppress. Parents sometimes are oppressive to their children. That's where child brutality comes in, where the children are terrified because the parents don't spank to correct. They spank to hurt and to bring harm and are brutal. It's all oppressive. It's all holding people down. Some of us grew up in oppressed homes where we were told we were nobody. We were never going to be anything. We couldn't expect to be anything. We were dumb. And, and so whether you were physically brutalized or not, that thing stuck in your mind. 
and it became an oppressive way of looking at life and looking at yourself. And you know when people have been affected that way because even when there's nobody surrounding them to oppress them, they oppress their own selves. Self-oppression. All designed to stifle your potential and your God-given future. And then, of course, there's the worst kind of oppression of all, spiritual oppression. That's where the devil has his way with your life. He's telling you, you've got to stay on these drugs. You've got to stay in this alcohol. You have to stay in this relationship that's doing you no good. You have to stay there. You can't break out. This is your lot in life. And you've been living with that spiritual oppression so long, you believe it's the truth. You believe you were born to be oppressed. The Bible says Jesus came to set the captives free. That oppression is not to be your middle name. That oppression is not to be the state that you live in. It's not to be how you operate, that you have been freed by creation simply because you're human and then even more so by redemption because you are a child of God. In the passage read in your hearing today, Israel is being held hostage in Egypt. Verse 23 of Exodus 2, now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. They were in bondage. Remember, freedom is released from illegitimate bondage. What happened? Well, if you look at chapter 1, verse 8, it says a new king rose in Egypt who did not know Joseph. The people of the sons of Israel, they said, are more mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Verse 12, and the more they were afflicted and the more they multiplied and they spread. Verse 13, the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor vigorously and they made their lives bitter with hard labor. The end of verse 14, which they rigorously imposed on them. Notice the words imposed, compelled, bitter, afflicted, taskmaster. They were being bound. They were being forced. They were being driven. Why? Why? Why was there oppression? Because the oppressor did not want them to be free. The oppressor said, if we let these people go free, they'll become too strong. That's what he says. And that's what oppression always wants to do. It wants to limit you becoming strong. It wants to limit what God can do in your life. And so it begins to work its insidious evil in order to stop you from realizing your maximum potential. See, that's how you have to look at this thing. You have to look at this thing, whether it's spiritual oppression or whatever kind of oppression it is, it's trying to stop you from what the U.S. Army wants you to do. Be all you can be. Because God has destined you for freedom which has to do with maximizing your potential under God. God has redeemed you for freedom. But the problem was there was an evil king who did not want them to be free, who wanted to keep them hostage. And I'm here today to tell you freedom is your middle name. And that I don't care how long you have been oppressed. They have been oppressed for 430 years. I don't care how old you are today. Today is the day of your freedom. Whether it's self-imposed freedom, freedom by somebody else, freedom even in a culture, unless you understand that oppression in any form is against the will of God, no matter how legitimate it's been made to sound by the oppressor. God's gift to you God's gift to you today is freedom. What did the king want? The king of Egypt wanted to use the children of Israel to further his agenda. What does the devil want? 
to use you to further his agenda. What he doesn't want you to do is to find out what God's got in store for you. He see, he doesn't want you to further God's agenda. He wants you to further his agenda. And he knows if he can hook you up on something that now controls you. That's why Paul says, I will be controlled by nothing. You can be led by people. You can be led by things. But once something is controlling you, it has taken over God's place in your life. And the Bible has a word for that. It's called idolatry. Nobody is supposed to be able to control you but God. Folk can influence, folk can lead, folks can direct, but they're not supposed to be able to put their thumb on you so that you define you by them rather than by what God has created you to be. It says that the people groaned in chapter 2. They sighed because of their bondage. Because oppression has a way of crushing the human spirit. It causes the spirit to just die, to just shrivel up. And you see it. You can see it on the face of a child who's been oppressed by a parent. You can certainly see it on a wife who's been oppressed by a husband. You can see it in a man's eyes who's been oppressed by his employer. Who's been made to feel like nothing. Uh, Look, if you're a janitor, if you're a janitor... You're supposed to be a free janitor. See, it's got nothing to do with with how much you make and what your title is. And that's why nobody has the right to your spirit but God. Now, they they may want to crush your spirit. They may want to tear down your spirit. See, that's why it's very important that you know that God tells you you're free. Because if you don't know that God tells you you're free, then other folks will define you and will be given permission. See, one of the worst things about oppression is not only that you're oppressed, but that you give the oppressor permission to keep oppressing you. Because you don't know who you are. If I have a gold ring on and you don't like it, you ain't make it. So you don't get to tell me what it is. It's gold because the manufacturer said it's gold. Now, you say, well, that ain't gold. Well, if I don't know what the manufacturer said, and I'm listening to what you tell me it is, I may not think it's gold anymore because I've given you more power than the one who made it. But as long as I can go back to the receipt and I can see that the man who made it said it's gold, It really don't matter what you think it is, whether you like it, whether you agree with it. Because I've been told by the one who made it that it's gold. Well, guess what? The one who made you say you're free. The one who made you defines who you are and defines who your reality is. So they were under oppression for all of this time. They were being held down. But then it says, verse 23 again of chapter 2, it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed and they cried out. That means they had not been crying out until the king of Egypt died. Follow me now. It says, when the king of Egypt died after many days, then they cried out to the Lord. Which means... They had been under the oppressor, the king of Egypt, for an extended period of time prior to them crying out to God. In other words, they got used to oppression until the king died. As long as the king was alive, they didn't like it, but they accepted it. When the king was no longer there to enforce it, they remembered God. You see, one of the things you need to understand, because the king, remember, in, in Egypt is the government. The king is the government. And it amazes me how much Christians look to the government to be surrogate God for them. And you know we do it because we want the government to do everything, the king. But he says, 
the king was the oppressor. The king was the one holding them down. It was only when the king was no longer there that they remembered that there was a God bigger than the king because the king had obscured God. Now, I ain't trying to get political, although I could. But the Bible is clear that the government should be both limited and taxes should be low. That's the biblical principle. Government limited, taxes are low. You cannot be free if you're not also willing to be responsible. You got a teenager in your house and they want to be free. They want to be free from mother and father and rules and regulations and got to be home at 10 or 11 or 12. I want to be free. Okay, are you ready to pay your bills? Okay, you see, if you demand freedom, you are at the very same time demanding responsibility. Don't tell me you want to be free, but you want, you want to be irresponsible. That's a contradiction in terms. God told Israel, he said, when you get to the promised land, don't expect any more manna from above. On the wilderness, I'm going to rain down your blessing. When you get there, pick up the shovel and the pick and you pick up the oxen and you pick up and you plow the land because freedom demands responsibility. So we got folk waiting for God to drop stuff from heaven when God is saying, I thought you wanted to be free. And that means you take ownership and responsibility in order to enjoy freedom. You can't enjoy freedom and be irresponsible at the same time. So the more, going back to political, the more you want the government to do, the less free you're asking yourself to be. Now, that's not a popular thing, and that won't get me votes, but I ain't running, so it don't matter. He says that when the king died, when government was no longer to handle this situation, they now are remembering God had a covenant. It says the covenant that he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They remembered God had something to say about this. What did God tell Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God says, I'm going to bless you, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They remember, and I'm going to curse those who curse you, and I'm going to bless those who bless you. So it dawned on them when they remembered the covenant, God said he was going to curse those who curse us because we're his covenanted people. Egypt has been cursing us with bondage and oppression. But God said, if they curse us, they curse him. Any of you ever had a big brother folk were messing with you and you, you say, well, I'm gonna go tell my brother. Or you had some cousins, or, you know, violent brothers, just. <laughs> In other words, you remembered you got somebody bigger than your problem. God says in the Abrahamic covenant, I'm going to curse those who curse you, bless those who bless you. You cursing me? You cursing God? Hey! It says they cried out to God. They remembered the covenant. You see, here's what oppressors, oppressors have some things in common. And the thing that an oppressor does not want you to have is information. See, Oppressors try to keep, that's why oppressors of people try to keep them uneducated because they know if they get a little knowledge, they're going to discover that they got the right to be free. You see, they want to keep you ignorant. They want to keep you uneducated about the realities that are yours. You see, they, they want to forbid you to get an education or certainly an equal education. They want to hold you down informationally because if you don't know, you can't go. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed January 1863. We didn't discover that in Texas till June 19th, 1865. That information about June 1863 was withheld from slaves in Texas. But we discovered the slaves in Texas in June 19th, 1865, that in January 1863, slaves were set free. Folk been partying ever since. <laughs> Juneteenth. Be partying ever since. 
You know what the party's over? Somebody gave some information. Now you're going to discover something as we go along and that is parties are not enough. Parties are fun. In chapter 15 it says, when the people got through the Red Sea, they had a party. It says Miriam left out and they all went dancing and celebrating deliverance. They celebrated deliverance, but you can be delivered and not free because they were partying about deliverance, still wanting to go back to Egypt. So partying is not enough. Barbecues won't cut it. (laughs) Oppressors always want to withhold information. See, a husband who's oppressing his wife and emotionally beating her down and maybe even physically. See, he doesn't want her to know on the tail end of that verse of submission, it says, wives, submit to your husbands, as to the Lord. See, all he wants, every time when I talk to her husband, he says she won't submit. But that's not the full verse. He doesn't want to know the other part of that verse. So when they're in front of me, I give them the rest of the story. That she is supposed to submit to you as to the Lord. So that if you're asking for submission in areas that God doesn't give you permission to ask for it or demand it, she is not obligated to submit to that. Now see, he get mad at me because I'm giving the rest of the information. Because oppressors don't want you to have the rest of the information because they want to keep you under their thumb because they want to control your future. Limit your destiny. So that you don't maximize your potential. And it's done on every single level. But it says they remembered the covenant. They remembered that God had made an agreement to curse those who cursed them and bless those who blessed them. But you see, if you don't know you're supposed to be free, If you don't know that that's your God-given right and your redeemed right as a Christian, you got a twofold right to be free. Creation and redemption. That is, freedom, remember, it's not doing whatever you want. Freedom is illegitimate bondage being released from in order to maximize your calling unto God. If you don't, if somebody doesn't tell you that, then you'll think slavery is normal. And I'm supposed to be messed up, jacked up, defeated, not making anything of my life, on drugs, on alcohol, in relationships. That they, do you know the amount of women who live year after year in abusive relationships? In abusive relationships because they don't think they're supposed to be free. I had a couple in my office and the husband is abusing the wife and it was clear, it wasn't a question mark. And then he said the wrong thing to me. He said, she's my wife, I'll do what I want. I looked over at her and said, when you go home, pack your bags and leave that fool. Okay, because he misunderstood his role. He was out of line. And he was forcing her down with faulty information and she was hooked in this unhealthy relationship in the name that I'm the husband. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, you're supposed to be God's husband, not a husband. You're supposed to be, you, you're, not, you're not from the street. You don't get your information from, from who let the dogs out. That's not where you do your data collection. And so we got this faulty information and we don't want to hear the rest of the story. And one of the ways you know, you know people are oppressed is they keep wanting to go back to their oppressor. Remember Israel said, chapter 14, look at chapter 14, verse 10. And Pharaoh drew near and the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they were very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now, last time I checked, they were crying out to God. In chapter 3, now they're saying, no, didn't we tell you we wanted to stay here? Because people who've been really oppressed can't leave the oppressor. That's why they go back to the drugs and back to the alcohol and back to the unhealthy relationships. And that's go, they would go back to the situation because they've been so conditioned. 
by oppression, that they are tethered back to it because they don't see their own value for freedom. They don't see their own value that you have been created and you have been redeemed to be free, to fulfill your calling under God. And anybody who seeks to take that is doing so illegitimately. And you need to know that. You may not be able to change the situation right now. It may be too big. It may be too social. It may be too economic. But at least you need to know that you've been called to be free. Some of us are slaves in our own home. And we're slaves in our own home. Because you got rooms in your home. None of the family can go in, but guests can go in. So in other words, you think more of guests than you do your own family. That you don't even go in there. You paying the bill. Some of us got dishes nobody can eat off of but guests. So guests come once a year. So the dishes are used once a year. So the best you have is for everybody else. It's not for you. Because you don't think enough of yourself that you are free to enjoy the things that company can have. Oh, I'm I'm all out there now. God declares you are free. And I'm not talking about, wait, little kids can break things and mess things up. That's being responsible. But I'm talking about free to maximize the goodness of God, the calling of God, and the purposes on your life. I am here to declare to you, you're free. God declares you're free and he is interested in setting his people free. Look back at chapter 3. He says in verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come up to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression, there it is, the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. God says, I'm aware of your pain. God is aware of your suffering. And he knows how long you've been suffering. The first thing he wants to do is give you some information. You have a right to be free. You have the right to take the initiative to pursue your freedom. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to remember, first of all, your covenantal rights. They remembered their covenant. They remembered God says, if they curse you, they curse me. They don't have a right to curse me. You've got to, first of all, know you have the right to be free, to be unencumbered from God's calling on your life. You you don't have the right to be irresponsible. You don't have the right to fall under God's chain of command. Children, obey your parents. Wives, legitimately submit to your husbands. Husbands, submit to Christ. You don't have the right to break God's plan and program, but you have the right to pursue your full potential under God. You have that right. You have the right to not let drugs tell you what to do anymore. You do have that right. You say, drugs are too strong. That's like saying the oppressor is too mean. It may be mean and it may be a tough taskmaster, but you need to know you have the right to be free. You have the right to be free. No woman in here, no woman in here under the sound of my voice should ever accept a man putting his hands on you. Ever. Ever. He has no right to put his hands on you. That's oppressive. That's a taskmaster. Who's saying, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to bring out the whip. He has no right to put his hands on you. And he's a punk if he does. I said it. Thumba, she made me hit her. What'd she do? Pick up your fist and drive it into her face? Is that what she did? You won't say Mike Tyson made you hit him. Not if you sane, because he crazy. 
You have a right to be free. You need to know that God's covenant is a covenant that frees you. The book of Galatians talked about one of the great freedoms you need to know about is freedom from legalism. Legalism are rules set up to hold you religiously hostage. They are rules set up to hold you religiously hostage. You will always know a legalist because they always define their Christian life by what you can't do. Anything that the Bible doesn't prohibit is allowed. Folk can't just make up stuff you can't do. You can't make up stuff. That's how cults are. Cults make up stuff. What they do, notice what they do. They control people. See, they control people. See, ministries that do not give you the freedom to fulfill your calling under God aren't legitimate. They're controlling. They're, in the name of God, they are oppressive. And so they make you so fearful about God going to beat you up. They make you so fearful that God going to get you. So what they do is drive fear. And they drive fear so that you can give them their money, so that you can make sure you're at every service, so you can do that. And they make fear. Your fear as the driving point of how well you function. And nobody can function free living in fear. You can't function that way. You can't maximize your potential because you're always trembling. You're always nervous. God has said you have the right to be free. Jesus said, I have come to set the captives free. Luke 4. Freedom is your right. Secondly, you cry out to God. You cry out to God. You make God your point of a reference because you're part of his covenant. You make God your point of reference. See, that's why dictator regimes want to limit religious expression. The reason why slavery was not allowed to sustain itself in America is because God was kept a part of the equation even to the point of the Constitution. So as long as you could appeal to a freeing God, then it always limits slavery. That's why those kind of regimes don't want God as part of the culture and they want to squash religious freedom because religious freedom makes people free. God is so committed to freedom, he told his disciples who wanted to call down fire from heaven to burn up people who weren't responding to that message, Jesus told them they have the right not to believe. You are free not to even believe. God gives you the freedom to reject him. You know how how much God believes in freedom? He gives you the freedom to say no to him. Not a wise choice. but one you are free to make. Freedom. When their human solutions were gone, they went to God and prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. It says that God, I give you permission to interfere in my affairs. And here's the thing. While they were in slavery, if you read all of chapter one, they're in slavery At the end of uh, chapter 2, they cry out to God, but between the slavery described in chapter 1, the oppression, and the crying out in chapter 2, there's a parenthetical statement or parenthetical passage, and it talks about the birth of Moses, the putting Moses in the Nile River, the finding of Moses by Pharaoh's daughter, the raising of Moses by Pharaoh's house, Moses killing the Egyptian, It tells that story between starting off with the oppression of Egypt and then going on to the people crying out to God. Why does it start off with the oppression, end with the people crying out for him to release the oppression, but in the middle of the story, put in Moses? Because while they were going through, God wanted us to know he was working on something. He was working on a deliverer. They didn't know God was working on a deliverer. All they knew is they were going through hard times. Can I tell you something? God is working on your freedom. You don't know it. You can't see it. God is working on your freedom. You say, but I can't see any way to be free. He's working on your freedom. You say, well, when am I going to get to see what God is working on? When you start crying out. They never saw it till they cried out for it. They never saw it. 
until they cried out for it. So, what am I saying to us today? I am saying, you have a right to be free, and because you do, you should be setting other people free. You know, the tragedy of the Revolutionary War was that people who wanted to be free from England went out and started making other folks slaves. That's a contradiction. You fighting for freedom while incarcerating the whole race of people. It's a contradiction. But we have the contradiction in our own lives. We want to be treated as free while we hold other folk hostage. No, no, no. No, no, no. If you want to be free, you should be setting others free. You should be releasing others within the bounds of propriety and what's right, releasing them to become all that they were called to be under God. There's so many gifts and talents that have been held hostage from your mama, your daddy, your uncle, been held hostage by the people you grew up with, by your past, by your, you mean, you are being held hostage. You're under this and you have the right to be free. But you say, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Okay, let me, let me help you out from an actor. His name is Charles Dutton. You know the actor. He was in prison. He was asked by a reporter one day, Charles Dutton was asked, how did you make it in prison? He said, the way I made it was I refused to decorate my cell. Now, you got to catch that. He said, the way I made it, I was incarcerated, couldn't get out. But other guys would have pictures up in their cells. They put flowers up in their cells. I wouldn't put any pictures up there. I wouldn't put any flowers because I was going to never make this home. Don't make your oppression home. Don't, don't make that home. Don't, don't act like this is where I'm supposed to be for the rest of my life so I might as well get comfortable here because I'm stuck. As long as God is part of the equation, you're not stuck. And you always look for that day when he's going to break through and open up that cell door. Don't put pictures up in your oppression. Don't make it think like this is the only place I'm ever going to be. And I'm never going to be nothing. And I'm never going to make anything out of my life. And I'm never going to make enough money to pay my bills. And I'm never going to be able to be used of God. And I'm never, I'm never. Not. That's putting pictures up in your cell. No, you never call an oppressed situation home. Don't call it home. When liberation finally came from slavery, American slavery, many of the slaves from the South began going north because they could get to express their freedom more in the north, was the thought. So they began going north. But there were a whole bunch of slaves who said, I ain't going north. And the reason I'm not going north is I've been a slave all my life. I didn't raise slave children. And I didn't raise slave grandchildren. I got married in slavery. Slavery is all I know. And in slavery, the master's going to feed me. In slavery, the master's going to clothe me. In slavery, the master's going to employ me. So if I leave slavery, I leave the master taking care of me for unknown territory. Now, you can talk about that land flowing with milk and honey up in New York and up in Boston. and all. You can talk about land flowing, but I ain't seen that. I've seen my life here. So I would rather be a comfortable slave than a risky free man. In other words, you can get so used to decorating your cell, you decide slavery is home. You just lie, I'm never going to be able to ascend. I'm never going to be able to to grow. I'm never going to be able to build my own business, even though I feel that's what God wants me to do. I'm never going to be able to do it because times are so hard and things are so bad and and I'm never going to be able to do it. That's the talk of a man who doesn't know God. That's the talk of a woman who doesn't know God. That's the talk of one who doesn't understand the covenant. God has declared you have the right to be free. Act like a free man. Walk like a free man, even if you have to walk in your cell. You walk like a free man, a free woman, one who's been declared to be free by God, one who's been declared to be free by redemption. You walk like a free man, talk like a free man. And I know folk ain't going to understand how you walking free in a cell because I've already consulted God and he got the key. So I'm practicing my free walk now. I'm practicing my free walk now. 
for the time when God opens up the opportunity for me to fully express it. Why not practice being free if you expect to be free? There's somebody here who needs to be set free from something and you got a right to be free. You have a right to be free. That's your right, your God-given right to be free. To be released from illegitimate bondage. To pursue your calling under God. I don't care what the devil has told you and who he's used to speak it. That's a lie. That's a lie. Your bondage is a lie. You say, but you don't know how long I've been there. It's just been a long lie. Because you got a right to be free.